Okay, first we're going to have a very short review of some of the things that Bill Wilson wound up with at the end of his talk last month on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram because his parting words were, how are all these different kinds of stars tied together? There's got to be some kind of pattern, and that's what we have to stay tuned for for this month. So let's just look back at what the promise was first. Einar Hertzsprung in Denmark and Henry Norris Russell at Princeton back in 1910 or thereabouts tried to see if there was some kind of correlation between the absolute magnitudes or luminosities. Remember what they are? The absolute magnitude is how bright a star would look if it were placed at a distance of 10 parsecs from our solar system. Or the luminosity is how luminous, luminous it truly is compared to the sun as one by definition. See if there's any relationship between that and the color or spectral type of a star. Remember the spectral classifications, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, O, B, a fine girl, kiss me. From the blue stars on the left side to the red stars on the right, yellow ones like the sun in between. See if there's any correlation there between the luminosity and the spectral type, which also involves the temperature, as we saw last month as well. Well, there's Hertzsprung and Russell facing away from each other symbolically because they did not collaborate on this. They worked independently and unaware of each other's work till somewhat later on. So they plotted the spectral type on the x-axis with decreasing temperature. I don't know if they realized that at the time, but normally when you lay out a graph, you start with the at the lower left corner, the origin, both variables increase as you go away from that point. Well, in this case, on the temperature, they did it backwards and they start with the hottest ones on the left and the coolest ones on the right. The luminosity is normal. It went up, up the vertical axis. The more luminous, the closer it was to the top. Now, the absolute magnitude, the numbers run backwards anyway, but you're used to that already, so don't worry about that. They found that they didn't get a random distribution. There was some order to it. Most stars that they plotted on their graphs fell along a line from upper left to lower right, a kind of a broad band from upper left where the hot and luminous ones are down to the lower right where the cooler and dimmer ones are, like this. Here's the what they referred to as the main sequence along the HR diagram. We can see luminosity going here, the sun, luminosity of one, and the absolute magnitudes going up as well, and the color and uh, spectral type along the x-axis. <coughs> they called this the main sequence because they made a mistake. They thought that what they had discovered was how stars evolved that stars would start out as big, hot, blue ones, and gradually, as they used up their fuel, sort of dwindle down and fade out as red dwarfs. Now, that's kind of a reasonable assumption. When you build a fire, it starts out hot and bright and eventually cools down to where there's nothing but smoldering embers. So they call this the main sequence because most stars were on it, and they called it sequence because they thought stars started out up here and wound up down there. I can't emphasize strongly enough that that is not correct. We still call it that because we inherited their early work and their terminology even though we know that that isn't correct. There are also stars in other parts of the diagram such as in the upper right corner where they were not just cool but also luminous and other strange ones down at the lower left. They were very hot but dim. Here's the ones at the upper right. They call those red giants or red supergiants. And here they were correct. If something is very low luminosity, low temperature, just barely glowing, yet it's extremely luminous, what's the only conclusion you can draw from that? It's got to be very big. So the stars in the upper right corner were low temperature, just like the red dwarfs, but they were very luminous because they were huge. 
By the same line of reasoning, the ones down at the lower left were white hot or even blue hot, yet they were not very luminous at all because it had to be very small. So despite their high temperature, their low luminosity, here's about one thousandth as luminous as the sun over here because they're very small. Those are the white dwarf stars. And finally, there are a few scattered around other places like across the top, down the left side, and there are stars all over the diagram, but most of them are on that uh, misnomer main sequence. Here's uh, some, they didn't knock themselves out with the ones across the top, there's one, <laughs> and then a few down the left side. So that's uh, some of the scattered ones around, but most of them are right along that belt through the middle. Here's kind of interesting thing. If we take all the nearest stars, and those of you who have signed up to get the Royal Canadian Astronomical Society handbook, there's a, several pages in there all, all about the nearest stars to our solar system. And most of them are red dwarfs. And of all the nearest stars, well, of course, the sun is in there. Alpha Centauri, the other nearest star, is like a twin of the sun. And there are a few others, but almost all of them are down on the lower right-hand part of the HR diagram. That is an interesting insight because that tells us that unless we live in a low-class neighborhood in the Milky Way galaxy, if we're typical of where we are, then most stars are actually red dwarfs. Most of the stars are very small. We'll see later on that that turns out to be correct and it's reasonable. Whenever a batch of new stars forms, it's a matter of dividing up the material in a nebula that's gonna become those stars. And they're not divided equally. Few things are. A handful of them get most of the goodies where most of the rest of the stuff is divided up many different ways among the little bitty stars that turn into the red dwarfs. On the other hand, if you go out and look at a star map or some uh, iPhone application and look at the sky, most of the stars you're gonna be seeing are not even on the main sequence. They're exceptions. They're unusually bright. They're not the ones that are lie along that band. Uh, Here's the sun again. The main sequence, of course, runs through there, and these stars right along this edge are part of the main sequence. All of these up here are total exceptions. So that tells us something else, that uh, the bright stars are exceptional. The ordinary stars are very unexceptional. So most stars are not stars. They're sort of minor. <coughs> Okay, and here was Bill's last slide from last month. How are all these related? Well, we're fixing to see. Here's where we start with a dark nebula, plural nebulae. Star formation starts in the dark nebulae, like the Horsehead Nebula in Orion. I'm sure you've seen pictures of it, or the Coal Sack in the Southern Cross. Can you all see that okay, or do we need to turn any more lights off? They, they, pop out a little. Let me see what it, nobody's going to be wandering around. It's always the last one. Yeah. Yeah, these are so pretty that I hate for you to miss them being washed out. Can you still catch them with the camera there? If you don't get me, that's fine. That's, that's a plus. <laughs> so, here's the Horsehead Nebula. These used to be thought there were holes in the sky where there wasn't anything, but now we know they're obscuring clouds in the foreground, blocking out light from behind. Here's one that I took in Australia. Here's the Southern Cross, and here's the coal sack, the dark area along the Milky Way. Almost looks like a shadow, that the, if this is like a little kite, it's casting a shadow on the Milky Way. But there's the famous coal sack. You can easily see it with the naked eye if you're south of the equator. The dark nebulae are found in the spiral arms of galaxies where we are. Here's uh, 
including the Milky Way. Here's a picture towards the center of the Milky Way. Here's Scorpius, recognize the fish hook tail. Here's Sagittarius, recognize the teapot there. Here's right towards the center of the galaxy. All these dark areas along here are dark nebulae that obscure the light from the stars in the background. And other galaxies. Here's NGC, for those of you not familiar with that terminology, that's the new general catalog. It has several thousand objects in it. I think Richard's still going after most of them. Uh, the Messier catalog has 110 objects. This has got thousands. So just in case you're wondering, you don't have to pace yourself on the Messiers because once you get through with those, there's plenty more to see. Well, here's one in a galaxy in Pegasus. Notice the dark areas along the plane of the galaxy in the spiral arms. Those are all dark nebulae, or areas of dark nebulosity. Here's one of our favorite galaxies for the autumn season, M33 in Triangulum. It's very large, but it's very dim. You have to have an exceptionally dark, clear night to see it at all. But when you can, you'll see all kinds of little dark areas through it that are the birthplace of new stars. And I've already mentioned that, that there used to be considered holes in the sky, but now we know they're obscuring clouds. Sort of like what we have here most of the time. <clears throat> Here's one more path along the Milky Way. You can see uh, Scorpius again up uh, here. There's Antares ahead of the Scorpion and Sagittarius. And here's Lyra, there's Vega and Altair and Aquila, all the way through the Alpha and Beta Centauri. Uh, about, this is about half of the Milky Way, uh, centered on the center. All those dark areas, dark nebulae, new star formation. They're also known as giant molecular clouds. Well, why is that? Well, at that very low temperature, just a few degrees above absolute zero, hydrogen atoms can associate into H2 diatomic molecules. Uh, heat drives them apart, but at that low a temperature, you actually have H2 gas and a fairly high extent. So they're called giant molecular clouds. Here's a, some numbers you've seen before, if you were here when we were going over the formation of the solar system. A dark nebula, consists mainly hydrogen, about 95%, 3% helium, roughly, and traces of other elements, 2%, everything else put together from the periodic table. If this is a second generation star or beyond, and of course they all are now, since we're well into the age of the universe, nearly 14 billion years now, a lot has gone on, which we'll see about this evening. Temperature only a few degrees above absolute zero, maybe three or four degrees on the Kelvin scale. And these are fairly large, these clouds of gas and dust, several hundred light years in diameter, about the distance from us to most of the bright stars in the sky. That's the typical size of a, a dark nebula that's starting to form into stars. Here's some other examples. The dark lanes in the Lagoon Nebula in Sagittarius, M8, which you've seen. The Trifid Nebula, M20. And the Orion Nebula, getting ready to come up on these evenings, M42. And the North America Nebula in Cygnus. Let's look at those. Here's the Lagoon, and again, the dark li lines through it that divide up the Lagoon are dark nebulae. Here's some nice ones in the Trifid Nebula, M20. And here's the Orion Nebula with dark fingers sticking in from the side. That's also a dark nebula. And here's a lot of people's favorite, near Deneb in the Summer Triangle, is the uh, North America Nebula. This Gulf of Mexico is not just a gap in this one, but it's a foreground cloud obscuring the pink light from behind that. The force of gravity causes particles, gas molecules, dust particles, to get closer and closer together. According to Newton's law of gravitation, the force between any two objects is proportional to the mass of each one 
and inversely proportional to the distance between them, squared. So every particle attracts every other particle. And if that causes them to move closer together, then the attraction gets stronger because the distance in the denominator is uh, making the uh, attraction even greater. So the, uh, it's a runaway process. As the particles get closer and closer and closer together, they start moving even closer together because of the force of gravity driving that. Also, remember, at a very low temperature, there's not much around to disperse the particles. So they've got nothing better to do than clump together. Process is accelerated, or sometimes, some astronomers think, even triggered by a supernova shock wave. Well, what's that? We'll see that right towards the end this evening. But of an exploding star, a shock wave moves through a nebula and might trigger the formation of stars. And uh, gravitational waves, maybe, from the rotating nucleus of the galaxy. We'll get into that uh, next month. Analogous to the condensation of raindrops within clouds. On a steamy day where it's just about to rain and it's all overcast and there are lots of water droplets in the air, if a lightning bolt occurs and you hear a thunder cap, clap, shortly after that, it'll probably start to rain. And the reason for that is the shock wave going through the cloud presses the little droplets closer together till they get big enough to where they can't fight gravity anymore and they fall down. So this is the same kind of triggering mechanism within a dark nebula. After a while, the nebula being so big, you know, several hundred light years in diameter, starts to break up into little pieces as the condensation occurs. The whole thing doesn't scrunch down to one spot, but within it, all scattered throughout, there are all these little condensations. And those are called uh, Bach globules, after Bart Bach, who studied this extensively. And they're only a few light years in diameter instead of a few hundred. And more and more, the, the accelerated gravitational contraction starts to generate heat. If you've ever pumped up a bicycle tire, you know that when you compress a gas, it heats up. And as these little particles uh, in the Bach globules get closer together, under their own gravity, making them smaller, then they start to warm up. At that point, they're not hot enough to glow. You don't see them but they do emit infrared radiation. So in the parts of the spectrum you can't see, you can uh, detect infrared radiation coming from these globules. When they reach about 100 degrees above absolute zero, which is still cold, that's still 173 degrees below the freezing point of water on the Celsius scale, then they start to call them protostars by that point. They gotten promoted to, instead of being Bach globules, they're now protostars. See, here's some other names that are kind of fanciful. If those protostars are surrounded by some more gas, and dust, nebulosity, they're called cocoon stars because they're wrapped up in kind of a blanket, sort of like the pigs in a blanket thing, uh, of the uh, surrounding material. As it continues to contract, it gets hotter and eventually gets hot enough to where we can actually see it glowing. Sort of like if you have an electric stove and you turn it on, it gradually, you know, it gets to where you hadn't better touch it, but you can't see it glowing yet, but after a while it gets red hot and then orange hot. And if you were a star, it might get hotter than that. So, all, as the star, a uh, new star, protostar, approaches the main sequence, it's eventually gonna wind up somewhere on that main sequence in the diagram. It starts, uh, it, it's probably rotating, and it sends out material above and below the plane of its rotation. We saw that a lot when we were looking at the solar system program a few months ago. Here's another little bit of terminology. Uh, things like Herbig Haro you don't need to know about. T Tauri star, the sun at one time was like that. The spectral class of the sun is G. Those are yellow stars, that's orange or red. For some reason, uh, because T Tauri was a G-type star, 
They call all of the G, K, or M stars T tauri stars as they're approaching the main sequence. And we'll see a diagram of that coming up. Stars also seem to form in chains or loops within the nebula, little strings of them like garlands or strings of Christmas lights. For the longest time, professional astronomers uh, disregarded that whole concept and amateur astronomers kept trying to prove it to them. Now it's in all the textbooks that they do form in the strings and loops and chains like that. So that was something amateur astronomers pioneered. Now how long does all of this take for a globule, a Bach globule, to become a T tauri star depends on its mass. And it may be backwards from the way you think. The more massive it is, the faster it goes. A one solar mass star, for example, what's a good example of a one solar mass star? The sun. <laughs> the sun. So the sun took about 50 million years to condense out of a nebula and get almost onto the main sequence where it is now. 50 million years. A 10 solar mass star, which is going to be a blue giant eventually, goes through the same process a lot more rapidly and only takes 200,000 years. Now, only in astronomy can you say only 200,000 years and mean something relatively fast. But when you're comparing it to 50 million years, that is fast. Okay, here's an HR diagram again, and here's the main sequence over here where the sun is now. It eventually started out over here getting smaller, hotter, brighter, and going through all kinds of contortions. This is only 10 degrees Kelvin here. That is very, very cold. Gradually getting hotter and hotter until it wound up where it is now. A 10 solar mass protostar does the same thing, but a whole lot faster and winds up, uh, say, 10,000 times as bright as the sun. But it does everything faster with more mass. And one considerably less massive than the sun, like one that's going to be a red dwarf, might take hundreds of millions of years compared to only 50 million for the sun. Here's all of that in one diagram. You could spend you know, quite a bit of time looking at this, but this just shows the pre-evolutionary tracks of all these stars, the very littlest ones, the red dwarfs there, the blue giants up here, and a one solar mass star there like the sun. And uh, these are the timelines, anywhere from uh, 10,000 years to 10 million years along this, depending on their size. So size does count in stars. Here's a young open star cluster NGC 2264 in Monoceros, the unicorn. Very beautiful cluster. We can see it in the wintertime. If you make a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram just of the stars in this cluster, this is what it looks like. You can see towards the upper left, a lot of stars are on the main sequence. But down near the right where the red dwarfs live, they're not on the main sequence. Well, what's the reason for that? They haven't gotten there yet. It takes a long time for those little stars to form, so they haven't alighted yet at some point on the main sequence. The big ones have and are already doing their business. And even the ones uh, like the sun are either there or getting there. But the ones down here have a ways to go before they wind up on the main sequence. Okay, here's the next step, emission nebulae. We've gone from dark nebulae to now emission nebulae. As the stars forming inside these nebulae heat the clouds of gas up to the point of glowing. And the first color light that comes out is the red light. And we'll take a look at just exactly where that comes from in just a moment. Sometimes you see the new stars embedded in the glowing nebula. Here's some examples, They're kind of the same examples we've been looking at, but we're going to look at different things this time. Here's the Lagoon Nebula again. We previously looked at the Dark Nebula there, but how about in here? Here's some stars embedded inside this, and they're getting hot enough now to cause the nebula to glow with this reddish light. 
Here's M16, the Eagle Nebula and Serpents and the pillars of creation that you see in a lot of Hubble pictures. This is with an Earth-based telescope, but you've seen this part of it, I'm sure. All this red glowing light from the stars getting hot and causing the nebula to glow. What's going on in the hydrogen atom? Well, here's the hydrogen atom in its ground state. It's got one proton in its nucleus and it's got one electron in a cloud around it. And in the ground state, we call that the first shell because the electron density sort of surrounds the nucleus like a shell. It can get excited. And when it does, the electron cloud gets farther away from the nucleus. As you put energy into it, it sort of moves up a rung on the ladder. And that excited hydrogen atom is bigger than the ground state one because the electron is now farther from the nucleus. How does it get like that? This arrow shows it going this way, but to get up, it had to start from here and then go up to there. Well, there are three ways. One is by heat, and that's what we just saw in those pictures of the nebula. The new glowing stars cause the hydrogen gas surrounding it to jump up to higher levels, become excited. Another is to absorb a photon. If a nearby object is sending out light, some of those photons could hit our cold hydrogen atom and kick an electron up higher. The third way, which you saw right here last month, was electricity. We don't have to worry about that in the stars, <laughs> but we can pass an electric current through a, a supply of gas and cause this same thing to happen. Uh, photons, heat, photons, and electricity. That's a way to excite the atoms to a higher state. Well, what goes up must come down. An excited hydrogen atom eventually goes back down, maybe to the ground state, maybe to some intermediate state. But when it does, it gives off that energy that it absorbed going this way in the form of a photon. And since this is all quantized, that is, these uh, little puffs of energy can only be certain levels, nothing in between, then these photons coming out all have a definite certain wavelength. And our next picture shows what you saw last month right here before your eyes. Here's a diagram. Here's the ground state, level one. Here's the second state that electrons can get in, which is the first excited state, then the third shell, the fourth shell, and so on. And the electrons normally are found in this level. But they can get kicked up by any of those three ways to any of these higher levels. And then as they fall back down, they give off that energy in the form of photons. Now, what happens if the, uh, an electron falls from here all the way down to the ground state? That gives off an awful lot of energy. In fact, the energy is so great that the photon, you can't see it. It's in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. So anytime an electron in a hydrogen atom falls all the way back down, you can't see that happening. That was happening up here. When we had the electricity going through the tubes of gas, this was happening, but you couldn't see it. Over here, if it only falls down a little bit, say to the third shell or the fourth shell, that's not enough energy to see. That's in the in, uh, infrared part of the spectrum. But like Goldilocks, if it falls from an upper level to the second shell, that's just right. The energy that comes off of those is in the part of the spectrum that you can see. That's visible light. The first one is when we go from the third shell to the second shell. The reason I'm spending time on this is because it's important as to what you actually see. This is called the hydrogen alpha line, which I'm sure you've all heard of. That is a three to two transition. And that makes the red light that you see in all these nebulae we've been looking at so far. That red glow comes from that transition. If we jump from the fourth shell to the second shell, that also gives off a photon that you can see, hydrogen beta, which is kind of the teal colored light that you could see and the next one from the fifth to the second is kind of blue violet and then deep violet. If you were looking closely last month with the handheld diffraction gratings, 
at the hydrogen lamp, which was the one in the middle actually, you could see all of those different lines at specific places because those energies are always the same when it goes from here to here, here to here, here to here. That always gives you a particular wavelength that you can see at the same spot all the time. Okay. I told you last month to notice the similarity between the hydrogen lamp and the Orion Nebula. Remember that? Here's the, you see the reddish part here is mainly three to two transitions. The bluish part is mainly four to two or five to two where you get more purple in there. Those are the hydrogen transitions, same as in the electrical caused ones you were looking at right up here last month. Eventually, here we go to the next phase, reflection nebulae as opposed to emission nebulae, which we were just looking at. Eventually, most of the gas and dust has been used up forming the new stars. And at that point, the thermonuclear fusion starts inside the star. And that's uh, the definition of when a star is born is when this reaction starts taking place inside the star. Four hydrogen atoms, or nuclei, fuse together to form a helium nucleus and energy is given off in the process. This is the same thing that takes place in a hydrogen bomb. Why is energy given off when we mash four hydrogens together to get a helium? Well, this helium nucleus weighs just a teensy bit less than the four hydrogen atoms put together. So when we combine the four hydrogens into one helium, a little bit of mass is lost. What happens to that mass? Yes, exactly. Multiply that times the speed of light squared. That's even on t-shirts. E equals mc squared. The amount of energy that's given off is the amount of mass that's lost times the speed of light squared. So even though it's a small amount of mass lost, by the time you multiply anything by the speed of light squared, you've got something significant. Uh, yes? We haven't got, uh, yes, this is the, this is what goes on in a hydrogen bomb is similar reactions is uh, sometimes use deuterium, sometimes lithium, but it's smaller elements fusing together to form larger ones. And that's, uh, okay, we'll get to that later. Okay, so now we've got a new star. Starlight reflects off of the little wisps of nebulosity that are still there, and that creates a reflection nebula. You saw starlight last month. The light that was set up over here was just an incandescent bulb with a filament in it. And when we ran the electricity through it, you didn't see sharp lines like you did with the hydrogen and the helium. Instead, you saw a continuous spectrum, like a rainbow. Anytime you see an actual rainbow, that's starlight, isn't it? Sunlight passing through tiny little prisms of raindrops, and the light has a continuous spectrum. And when it reflects, when a starlight is reflected, uh, you see a continuous spectrum. You don't see like the bright line spectrum like you do in the red glowing nebula. So a reflection nebula has the same spectrum as the star whose light is being reflected. Trifid Nebula again. Here's uh, an example of that. We're not looking at this part this time. Remember, this is three to two transitions, electrons jumping down, that red light being given off. Here's a blue giant star that's just been formed, and this blue nebula up here is just reflecting its light. If you looked at this through a prism or a diffraction grating, you would see the bright lines in that spectrum. If you looked at this, you would see a continuous rainbow, the same as if you looked right at the star. So this beautiful object is kind of a lesson in uh, emission nebula here and a reflection nebula up here. And I'm <laughs> maybe heretical, but with a 10-inch telescope, I can convince myself that I'm seeing the difference in the blue and the red colors between those two parts of the M20 trifid nebula. Here's another one, and 
Auriga, a flaming star nebula, and here's probably everybody's favorite, the Pleiades, M45 and Taurus, the little bitty dipper, if you will, but the starlight from all these blue giant stars is reflecting off of the nebulosity around it, and if you analyze that light, they'd all be rainbows, no sharp lines. Okay, this summarizes everything we've seen so far. A wide shot of the Horsehead Nebula. There's a dark nebula, the first stage. Here's nice emission nebula with the three to two transition in the hydrogen. And here's the bright blue star and nebulosity reflecting. And this one just on the edge of each there, those are reflection nebulae. So that's everything we've seen so far. Now, moving on, open star clusters. Finally, all of the original gas and dust is gone. It's either been incorporated into the new stars or blown away by the heat and light from the new stars. So there's nothing left but bare naked stars at that point. And we call that an open star cluster. Open because they're irregular in shape. Some people call them galactic clusters. I don't care for that term because it might confuse you with a cluster of galaxies but this is a galactic cluster which is inside of a galaxy in the spiral arms. What do we officially call a cluster of galaxies? Cluster of galaxies. That's it, a cluster of galaxies. <laughs> Here's some examples of very nice looking open star clusters, the Beehive Cluster in Cancer, uh, right between Gemini and Leo in the spring sky. And Here's one of my favorites from the Southern Hemisphere. It's in the Southern Cross next to Kappa Crucis, and it really looks better than that. It almost looks like a little string of Christmas lights, all the different colors of the bright stars, and they're very beautiful. Globular clusters to finish up the formation of stars. They um, probably formed the same way, but with some important differences. For one thing, they all formed at once back at the beginning of the galaxy not continuously in the spiral arms of the galaxy like the ones we've been looking at, but as part of the formation of the galaxy. And they're located in a halo around the center of the galaxy as opposed to being embedded in the spiral arms. Here's a diagram of that. Our galaxy edge on, see all that dark stuff along there, that's where the new open star clusters are forming. But the globular clusters are in the halo surrounding the center of the galaxy. Another difference is that there are a lot more stars in them. If we look at uh, these, like M13, Omega Centauri, here's M13, I think Rick's favorite one to show off to people in the summertime, and Hercules, maybe uh, 100,000 to two or 300,000 stars in that cluster, way more than the few dozen that you typically see in an open cluster. And here's the granddaddy of them all, Omega Centauri, which you can just barely see from Memphis. It's uh, in Centaurus, just above the southern horizon. So you have to find a spot when Spica is on the meridian and look down a road or somewhere where you got a clear shot of the southern horizon and then stand on tiptoe besides. And then you can see this, and in the binoculars, it just knocks you over. And in a telescope, it's amazing. In Australia, it's almost overhead, so it's like the M13 there. It's a glorious sight. You can just look at it all night. In the 30-inch telescope, it's almost a spiritual experience. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, trying to think of what size I was looking through. I think it was a 20 that they had in the observatory that I saw that mainly through. Uh, okay, after new stars are formed, they spend most of the rest of their lives on the main sequence, that band on the HR diagram from upper left to lower right. Here's kind of an aside to make you scratch your head a little bit. One new star is formed each year in the Milky Way galaxy. Does that mean that, okay, uh, in 2015, here's a star chunks out of the assembly line. Next year, another star comes out. No, it, it takes millions of years, but there are millions of them going on at the same time. So on the average, we get about one star a year, or you could say a million stars every million years if it helps you uh, assimilate that idea. 
The exact point of a star's location on the main sequence depends on its color, the left to right axis, and the luminosity, the vertical one. It is a graph. Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is just a graph with X and Y coordinates. As long as the star is on the main sequence, what's it doing? It's converting hydrogen into helium by that thermonuclear fusion reaction, which releases the heat and light. Here's some strange kind of drawings here, but this shows the main reaction that goes on in the sun, the proton-proton reaction. One proton reacts with another and forms the deuterium nucleus. That deuterium nucleus reacts with another proton and forms a light helium nucleus. Then, a couple of others do the same thing over here. Then the two light helium nuclei fuse together and uh, become a regular heavy a standard helium nucleus and get two of the protons back. If you add all of these reactions together, it's what we had earlier, isn't it? Four hydrogens goes to one helium and a couple of positrons, a couple of neutrinos, and the gamma radiation carries off the energy from the center of the star eventually out to the surface. So this is what's going on inside the sun. You may be worried about if you know that protons are positively charged, why would they get close enough together and fuse and merge with each other? <laughs> Intense gravitational pressure and temperature. If you get them close enough together, which from the pressure of the gravity is one factor, if you get them moving fast enough where they collide with each other really fast, that overcomes the repulsion and then they merge. So high temperature, high pressure at the center of a star makes this happen. That's why it's so hard to generate that on Earth and make a fusion reactor because you have to simulate the conditions of the interior of a star in order to get it to work. They've got it to where it will work for almost a second before everything melts down now and they get almost as much energy back out as they put into making it in the first place. But there's a ways to go on that. Now, here's the important thing about stars on the main sequence. The energy released exactly balances the force of gravity trying to collapse the star. If it weren't for the reactions going on in the center, the star would just collapse down to one little point. But once that reaction starts, it's trying to expand. So you have a balance, a hydrostatic equilibrium, as we call it. Whoops. Um, at this point, you can see gravity pressing in pressure pressing out, but the arrows are the same length, so that spot doesn't move. The star is in equilibrium. Farther out towards the edge, there's less pressure because it's farther from the center, and there's less gravity because it is farther from the center, but they still balance. So any spot within the star is in balance with the force trying to make it expand from the pressure inside and gravity trying to make it collapse. How long do stars last on the main sequence? Once the thermonuclear fusion begins, it depends on their mass and luminosity. Here's the Bayer equation for it. Mass compared to the sun divided by the luminosity compared to the sun times 10 billion years, because that's the known lifespan of the sun. So if you put in one here, one here, the lifetime, 10 billion years. That's kind of a duh thing, a tautology almost. However, the luminosity of the star depends on its mass. Now, here's one of the most important ideas of this evening. What makes a star shine in the first place? That thermonuclear fusion going on in the center. What makes that happen? The gravity squashing the center. What kind of star squashes the center more than the other? A light one or a heavy one? A heavy one. So the heaviest, most massive stars carry out this same reaction that we've been looking at faster, which makes it put out more energy, which makes the star more luminous. So the luminosity of the star depends on its mass. And the greater the mass, the more rapidly the reaction occurs, and the more luminous it is. Here's kind of a graph showing the relationship between the mass across here and the luminosity or absolute magnitude this way. It kind of looks almost linear, doesn't it? But, however, this is a logarithmic scale that way, and magnitudes are logarithmic, so it's a log-log scale. Here's what tells you what's going on. 
the luminosity is proportional to the mass to the three and a half power. You don't see that kind of relationship that often in physical science where something has an exponent that big. In other words, if you made the mass twice as big as the sun, that star would be 11 times as luminous as the sun. So it's a very pronounced sensitive effect. So the lifetime of the stars on the main sequence really only depends on the mass. When the original nebula pi is divided up, there's only one thing that determines where it is on the main sequence, how long it lasts, and that's how much mass is in it. The lifetime of a star is, we can put the, uh, substitute the luminosity in for the, its expression in terms of mass, and we see that the lifetime of a star is 10 billion years divided by its mass to the two and a half power. That's still a big effect, isn't it? So the more massive a star is, the shorter its life. Think of it in terms of rock stars or baseball players or something like that. The ones that get huge amounts of money, what happens? They spend it all at once and they probably die penniless in the gutter where somebody's just graded papers all their life, just uh, <laughs> keeps, keeps chugging along. <laughs> we can put it in terms of the luminosity, but the same result occurs. The, the more massive it is, or the more luminous it is, the shorter the lifespan is, because those are in the denominator. Okay, sun, 10 billion years, life is half over. Rigel in the heel of Orion, a blue giant, 60,000 times as luminous as the sun. So it'll only last 4 million years instead of 10 billion. It really goes through its fuel in a hurry. The more fuel it's there, the faster it burns it up. A red dwarf, on the other hand, is maybe only 70% as massive as the sun and 35% as luminous. It can chug along for 20 billion years. Well, how old is the universe? Less than that, less than 14 billion. So probably all the red dwarf stars ever made are still on the main sequence somewhere. So they haven't ever gotten to the end of their lifetimes yet. Now as the individual stars in a star cluster reach the end of their lifetimes, they start to leave the main sequence. And that's what the second half of the meeting is gonna be about is what happens to stars at the end of their lifetimes? As long as we're talking about the main sequence, we want to take a look at what happens here. The most massive blue giant stars, the ones on the upper left, are the first ones to leave the main sequence. And they become red supergiants. And then there's not going to be any blue giants left in that cluster. And gradually, as the cluster gets older and older, stars farther down the main sequence peel off and go towards the right, so there's nothing left on the upper left part of the main sequence on the HR diagram. So you can get a rough idea of whether you're looking at an old cluster or a new cluster, just make an HR diagram, piece of cake there, and if, if there's stuff all the way up to the upper left, you know it's a young cluster if it's still got blue giants in it. If it's nothing brighter than a solar type star in there, you know it's a pretty old cluster. Here's a diagram of a bunch of uh, star clusters. Here's one that's got stars all the way up to the upper left end of the main sequence, H and Chi Persei. What's that? That's the double cluster. Yeah, most of you have seen that or found it or looked at it. H and Chi Persei. What do you see when you look at that? You see a lot of blue stars and you see a lot of red stars. I always say, look for the red giants because those are ones that used to be blue giants. They've left the main sequence. They're now over here. Uh, cool, huge, uh, enormous stars that are red giants, and you'll see those. There's still all of these down here, but why don't you see those when you look at it? Well, these are 10,000 times brighter. <laughs> so you're going to see the bright ones up at the top here before you see all of these others down here. They're there. So there's the one just with uh, the double cluster, and... Here's one, M67, an open cluster in Cancer. What do we know about this one? Well, it kind of gives it away there. That's an old cluster. When this kind of information first came out, I heard a lecture on this in Pittsburgh, and the astronomer talking about it had all of these graphs and everything, 
And somebody in the audience asked him where M67 was. And he didn't know. He had never seen it. He had never observed this thing. He just got somebody's data and started making graphs and doing calculations and things. And if you do just one or the other, you're missing half of astronomy. So that's where we are at this point. After we get back, which is the shorter part, we will uh, take a look at what happens to the different types of stars as they reach the end of their lifetimes, which includes uh, uh, supernovae, neutron stars, black holes, and the whole works there. So let's take a short break and resume. Okay, thank you.